wall or a brick silo that keeps one business separate from another. So let's say we buy a tire company, okay? If we put a strong corporate veil around that tire company, if the tire company goes broke, the people to whom it owes money can only get at the assets of that tire company. Now, this sounds kind of arcane, but when you see it applied across Coke Industries, here's what it looks like. The company creates hundreds of nominally independent corporations, LLCs, S-Corps, and other corporate structures that it can use to buy up other firms, knowing that if one of those firms goes south and goes broke, and, and creditors try to come after the money Coke borrowed to buy it. Coke is shielded. Coke is protected. Is this all legal? Absolutely. And when you write about this corporation, the word legal becomes so fascinating and so complex. <laughs> it, it, it really does. Coke Industries... Their core competence is mastering complex systems. I mean, this is a company born and bred, running big machines at oil refineries, very complicated pipeline networks. They know how to master complex systems, and the law is no different. And, and what you see time and time again in the history of this corporation is that it's operating at a level that normal folks don't get to operate. At. And what I mean to say is the question of, was that legal or was that illegal, becomes a question that at times has to be hashed out in court over 10 years. And, and multiple people I interviewed at Coke Industries explained to me that, you know, this company is extremely good at playing up to the edge in these gray areas. The company is very conscious about not blatantly violating the law after it had a series of massive uh, criminal cases during the 1990s. But at times, when you operate in these highly, highly complex environments, you can play right up to the edge of violating the law. And then the question becomes, did I break the law? Prove it. How, how good are your lawyers? And some of the like regulatory laws and financial laws are so complex with loopholes in them that you can manipulate them if you're smart enough. Well, I think a postcard example of this is when Coke Industries helped build these deregulated electricity markets in California back in the year 2000. And it's very clear from the historical record that when the deregulated markets for electricity got up and running in California, Coke Industries and other traders began immediately to manipulate those markets. But to prove that it happened took 10 years. There's a federal uh, regulator over this stuff called the Feder Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And I've looked through thousands of pages of FERC investigations and court hearings and this highly complex process just to prove that Coke traders unlawfully took at least hundreds of thousands of dollars in profits illegally. So one of the things that Coke Industries did was to branch out into the trading and derivatives market. So here we're talking about Wall Street kind of deals. Complicated trading instruments that uh, I, every time I learn about them, I kind of quickly forget what they are because they're, so <laughs> they're so complicated. So we're not going to yeah. get into the weeds on that. But these are things uh, like trading commodities and g give us some words to use to describe the basics. Yeah. And, and I'm really glad we're talking about this because I found that trading, just that word writ large trading, trading is at the core of this institution. Trading is the the strategic heart of Coke Industries. And when you understand how this company engages in trading, you understand how they engage in business, and you very much understand how they engage in politics. It really draws back to the same thing. So since, since the 1970s, Coke has been one of the world's largest traders of energy supplies. What that means is Coke would buy and sell literally whole super tankers full of crude oil or tanks full of crude oil, these physical supplies of energy. Well, the key to being a successful trader is essentially knowing more about the world than anybody else knows. 
for example, if somebody out there is willing to sell a barrel of oil for fifty dollars, the Coke trader might know that that oil is actually worth fifty-two dollars. So when that's the case, the Coke trader piles into that trade, buys all the oil at fifty dollars they can, sits on it. Waits for the world to wake up to the fact that oil is actually worth fifty-two dollars, and then Coke sells it and can make hundreds of millions of dollars making trades like this. So, for this reason, the senior executives at Coke who built the trading division realized early on that the most important resource Coke deals with isn't crude oil or natural gas or coal; it's information. It's the information. That they could glean from selling all of these products, and and the analysis they could apply to that, which allowed Coke to know more about what was going on in energy markets than anybody else knew. Fast forward to the year two thousand, Coke Industries bought an entire natural gas pipeline company just to get the information it possessed. The company was called Gateway Pipeline. It owned hundreds of miles of pipeline. Coke didn't care about the pipes. It didn't care about the gas. It wanted to simply learn because that pipeline network was connected to America's energy infrastructure at at least dozens of different points where gas was being sold every single day. And with every sale, Coke would learn in real time what the demand was for gas and what people were willing to pay. And it would take that information. Send it to supercomputers in Houston, Texas, where it ran a giant trading shop, and then augment it with these other very complex sources of information. I mean, Coke would tap into obscure databases of the Park Service in California to figure out snowfall on the mountains there. Snowfall is a leading indicator of snow melt, which is a leading indicator of reservoir levels, which is a leading indicator of hydroelectric supplies. So Coke. Puts that information into the mix. It draws in information about what kind of oil is being delivered to the United States, which helps it figure out what its competitors are doing. It hires meteorologists. <laughs> <laughs> Coke, Coke literally went on a hiring spree and took the best stars、uh, from the Weather Channel and and other channels like that to come in house and predict the weather just a little bit better. Than everybody else, and these meteorologists told me how they would just laugh at the weather report because they knew it wasn't that close. This is worth a lot of money because when you have a, just a tiny bit of an edge, knowing how cold it's going to be in Cleveland, you can anticipate energy supplies. So the Koch brothers use this not only to figure out pricing for actual things in the real world. They start trading in the markets, like in the stock market kind of markets. That are basically bets on what prices will be, and since they have so much information, they make more and more <laughs> money just trading on these like speculative options. Is that the right word? Derivatives. Well, that's that's exactly the right word. Derivatives, and let's just keep it very simple and say they're insurance contracts on natural gas supplies. But the market for this is so enormous. That a natural gas derivatives traders can can make hundreds of millions of dollars in profits a year for the company just by selling these insurance contracts on natural gas prices. And again, Coke made more money betting on natural gas derivatives than it actually made owning the actual pipelines themselves. My guest is Christopher Leonard, author of the new book Coke Land: The Secret History of Coke Industries and Corporate Power in America. After we take a short break, we'll talk about the Koch's influence on American politics. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Support for this podcast comes from HBO's limited series *Our Boys*, the gripping true story of the tragic events that led to war in Gaza. In 2014, Israel is shaken when three Jewish teenagers are murdered by Hamas militants. When a Palestinian boy goes missing, tensions escalate into violence. Our Boys follows the riveting investigation and reveals how the Jewish and Arab communities were forever transformed, based on actual events. Watch Our Boys Mondays at 9 p.m. only on HBO. Let's get back to our interview with Christopher Leonard, author of the new book *Coke Land: The Secret History of Coke Industries and Corporate Power in America*. The Coke brothers, Charles and David, are famous for the wealth they've amassed through Coke Industries. Together, they're worth more than a hundred billion dollars, and for creating a powerful political influence network. 
Let's talk about the Koch brothers' political agenda. One of the, the major things they've opposed over the years is environmental regulations, regulating greenhouse gas emissions that contribute to climate change. What's their record as polluters, both in terms of emissions released into the air and toxins released into water and the land? Well, they are one of the largest registered polluters in the United States, according to EPA documents. They're one of the largest emitters of, of various pollutions. I mean, this is a company that owns very, very large chemical plants, very, very large fossil fuel refineries. It, it's, it's a kind of business that produces uh, a lot of emissions and, and a lot of pollution of different kinds. The issue of carbon is at the heart of Coke's business and, and Coke's future. And it's not just because of the carbon and greenhouse gas emissions that Coke itself uh, puts out through its refineries or other operations. Coke has an enormous, almost incomprehensibly large investment sunk into the fossil fuels business. It owns two of the largest refineries in the United States. It trades all this crude oil uh, around the world. It, it has built pipeline networks to handle this newly fracked crude oil. So when you look at this equation of what would happen if we put a price on carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions, the real threat is that that might reduce demand for fossil fuels going out 5, 10, 20 years. If that happens, the sunk value of this massive industrial globe-spanning infrastructure, the 